Oh, yeah, Dave, all right, guys, Dave Mad Max 6, we are back for your favorite series as the doc on JTV. Doc, it's been a minute. Yep. <laughs> we're back on the show, and then we're going to get started right away with the first question. You want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. So the first question is from a, a sub Ram, it says. Um, hello, Dr. Ran and Dave. Yet another ardent follower here. Good. I had attempted to figure out the following problem myself, scouring through some research papers like, and he makes reference to one, uh, but realized that this is a subject matter of only experts and involves complex mathematics and then thought about Dr. Rand. So here's my question. What does it mean to split a single dose of 250 milligrams per ml of sustenon into two doses of 125 milligrams per half ml Okay. Yeah, so basically he's split, he's splitting the dose into And administered at two different sites, say left and right delt, at the same time. How does it alter the peak levels and half-life and elimination? So the, the article I looked up earlier, and the article references using, if this is the same one, um, NPP versus nandrolone decanoate. And in this study, it was a relatively small study, like maybe 15, 20 people total, if I remember it right. Um, they're using these two different esters, and they're also using different sites, deltoid versus gluteus, and they're also using an oil base, and in one case they're using one ml, and the other case they're using four mls to carry the same strength same dose of the nandrolone. So we've got a couple things going on here. We've got two different esters and we've got, well, we've got more than a couple. And we've got two different sites and we've got uh, two different amounts of excipient, we'll call it, okay? The different oils, the amount of the oil. In essence, to make this very easy to not break down the study, which the viewers don't even know what I'm talking about here because only this gentleman knows. Uh, to what I'm referring, and thus we can post something like this on the website for people post facto here, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, bottom line is whether you inject in multiple sites, in other words, divide the dose or not, if you give it to yourself at the same time, you're still going to have that amount in your system. So it's not going to change the pharmacokinetics for that reason. It's not going to change the absorption rate and the peak levels. But as was pointed out in the article and in, in other studies as well, the site does make a difference. So if you inject in the deltoid versus the gluteus, that'll make a difference. The gluteus is a bigger muscle, I would think in most people. <laughs> and um, you're gonna have much more blood flow, so you're gonna have the, the substance picked up better, absorption. better through the gluteus than you would through uh -oh. the deltoid. So certainly you're gonna have a, a, a faster peak value for that reason. Now again, we're not getting into NPP versus nandrolone decanoate. Obviously, well, I shouldn't say that. NPP is uh, more quickly absorbed, but that's for a totally different reason. But again, for purposes of what I think this gentleman's asking, um, the site will make a difference, but also uh, to something that we've addressed before, if you use the gluteus area, and what I mean by that is you're using sub-Q at the glute versus sub-Q at the deltoid. The, the deltoid versus glute really doesn't make a difference. The fact that it's sub-Q, I guess is what I'm saying, yeah. versus intramuscular will also make a difference in the, in the speed at which it gets absorbed and there the, therefore the peak value and, and part of that is, is the speed, uh, et cetera. So um, I hope I'm answering the question without sounding too Byzantine here. But um, yeah, there's a lot in that article that has more to do with it, I think, just splitting the dose up. The area, bottom lining it, uh, where you inject is important. Uh, the area, including not just the muscle group, if you will, but how deeply you go into the muscle or mm -hmm. not, if it's sub-Q or in just the adipose tissue, because the adipose is not as well vascularized, I think, obviously, to, to most, than muscular. That's what really makes a difference. Um, other than the ester form. I know that. Very cool. Thanks, Doc. 
All right, Doc, what else we got? Next question today is from someone refers to him or herself as D. It says, hi, Dave, thanks for the opportunity. I'd like to ask the doc if the optimal or target free testosterone range is the same if one is on exogenous testosterone, let's say 300 milligrams a week test a cycle, or different compared to the healthy high youthful levels of free testosterone. There is conflicting information on the web, more often than not pointing out that since free T from esters doesn't fluctuate during the day, the same free T number from esters gives you more bang per buck than free T numbers on blood panels taken when you are using your own production. Uh, he's making reference to some studies here. Looking at a few studies seem to prove this, but I'd like to hear the doc's opinion. Um, he's pointing to study one, and again, maybe we can put this on the website. I don't know, post facto, but it says, uh, shows guys on 300 milligrams a week of tests and anthate having 13.8 plus or minus 2.1 nanograms per deciliter free T and gain an average 5.2 plus or minus 0 0.8 kilograms of fat-free mass in 20 weeks without training when healthy range for healthy range is for males 35 to 40 years uh, 4.65 to 18.1 nanograms per deciliter okay I'm not going to read through the rest of this because he references another study but I don't think this is in keeping with the question first of all I think the question is more or less about the number, meaning either total testosterone versus free testosterone in someone who's using exogenous testosterone versus one's own endogenous production. Mm -hmm. That's comparing apples and oranges for uh, more than one reason. First of all, while bioidentical hormone replacement testosterone approximates real endogenous, if you will, testosterone, it's not the same. It's, I, I liken it to the same, the same hand, but without fingerprints, bioidentical testosterone, uh, so that it does fit in the glove, but it's not yours. I also believe, and I'm saying this carefully because I don't believe we've got studies showing it out there. This has just been my experience, and there, for the record, just my theory uh, that um, we, well, I say it's just my theory. I've said this before and it's, and it's been known since the 1950s. In order to get, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, we might have to edit this a little bit. <laughs> You're good. In order to get uh, clinical benefit from replacement therapy, you're going to have to see a number of serum testosterone, total testosterone, of about 800 nanograms per deciliter. And again, we've known that number since about the 1950s. That's a really healthy total testosterone for a 20-year-old, anybody. So it sets the bar a little higher. Why? The rest of this part, now from here, is just sort of my theory, if you will, from looking at this over the years. It takes more to get more as you get older. We see that in nature a lot, whether it's because the receptors have down-regulated perhaps, or the receptors just don't work as well as they used to, or other factors like the epigenetics of it all just doesn't operate with the, the source code, the genes, you know, like it's supposed to, and we don't make as much of the RNA. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why something that used to take us farther before doesn't take us as far now, so you know you need a little bit more to get farther. Uh, so I think that's most of what we see here. But um, to look back at his question, um, you're going to need more replacement testosterone in my experience to get the same amount of result, if you will. Yeah. From endogenous production so yeah. that you know, 800 nanograms per deciliter to use total testosterone and we really should be talking about free testosterone uh, the, the the exogenous testosterone required to get to that number 
will not do as much as the endogenous production will to get to that number. Does yeah, that, that make sense? sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see if there's, as for the rest of it, um, he makes references to those on aromacin versus, um, well, yeah, again, without going into the study, I don't think this one applies to, to what I just said in the question as much as what I said. So yeah, yeah. let me let me just leave it at that unless there's something yeah. else in that question. You think I think that's, that was the gist okay. of the question. Yeah, you want to know. Awesome. Thanks, Doc.